Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I am co-hosting today with Miss Angie Tillman. Y'all know Miss Angie Tillman from Athens, Georgia. And of course, we've got Davey Jackson back on the channel. How are you guys doing today? I'm good. Real I'm good. great. I'm feeling awesome. kind of hot, though. We, and we've never <laughs> courted with such a hot guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the filters. It's the filters that are making me look good. I'm very haggard in real life. Maybe I got a lot of emails from some girls last time we filmed together asking about your your personal life. And I was like, I have no idea. Like, I don't know. Um, I'm single and toxic. Come on through. <laughs> toxic. <laughs> but you can follow his channel. Uh, and yeah, maybe that's right. Know better. Um, so speaking of Davey, before we get into today, I don't, wanted to give you a moment because you just released um, the Colt Kid, a comedy special. And if you guys have been following me for a while, you know that I can go serious in a very deep, deep rabbit holes of serious conversations, but I also love stand-up comedy. So of course I watched your special. I'm a huge fan. So can we take a moment? Do you want to plug your, um, your, your stand-up comedy special forever for my audience? And I'll, I'll link that in the description box below as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. The cult kid comedy special. It's my debut comedy special on YouTube. Uh, it's, it's just 20 minutes and it's primarily about growing up in the shiny, happy people cult. Uh, cause you know, with a situation like that, with all the trauma that was involved, you're either going to laugh or cry. I would prefer to laugh, uh, and, and find ways to continue laughing through all the trauma. Uh, it was so much fun. We recorded it, uh, here in San Antonio in front of two sold out audiences, which was just so, so, so cool. Um, had a ton of fun with it. Had some really cool people involved that helped out a lot. And, um, yeah, I, I'm just I'm so happy that I was able to record something like that. I I had not planned on recording a special for at least another year. Uh, but when everything happened with the the Prime Video documentary, Shiny Happy People, and you know some of the podcasting that I was doing, I figured, you know what? Let me just take the jokes that are specifically about growing up homeschooled in a cult and make that into a 20 minute special and just put it out there for the world to see. And so I'm sure I will regret that. Uh, a couple years from now, when I look back and see how much my comedy has matured, and I, <laughs> I see this thing that I did in the heat of the moment, and I'll probably cringe and stay awake until two or three a.m. just thinking about it and how much I hate myself. But uh, you know, it was still a really fun experience, and and thank you so much for uh, uh, for promoting that, Bryce. No, it was it was awesome, and I got. I mean, I I sit here all day. I'll sit here if I if I, if I don't like monitor my time i will literally sit on like instagram and just watch shorts of people being funny because I, I i i appreciate comedy and i appreciate it takes a very smart person uh of high intellect to be able to make jokes like that and i will say one thing i noticed about looking at your shorts too davy is you're really good at mm -hmm. like the quick witted like you're good with your audience interaction too like making a quick lit witted i could never do that so you guys please check it out um it is hysterical we got a lot of ex-christians or christians on this channel seeking a new way of looking at their religion and so i would highly suggest it's very relatable even for those of us that didn't grow up in a religious cult <laughs> it's still very relatable to that conservative christian side and that is why Angie, I think I told you off camera, David. I know, An uh, David, I know Angie and I, we talk about all the time. Angie grew up very similar to the way that Davey grew up. Um, she did not grow up in a specific organization, but um, but you were, even before Davey hopped on, Angie, you were like, I kind of did grow up in a cult. So do you just kind of want to give a little bit of your background and we can go from there? And Well, even watching you know, the very first episode of that Shiny Happy People documentary, um, and that's the only one I've seen is the first episode, but the you know i was watching it going that, <laughs> those people look like 
the people, <laughs> you know, the people that I grew up around or in the churches, like my, my parents go to a primitive Baptist church. And that's even like, it, there's not even a piano in that church. There's mm. no music. There's no, and we know music is healing. So I'm like, why can't you have music? And, you know, then my, my dad's real big into that church, but yet he plays harmonica and guitar and, you know, goes and drinks his beer and whiskey and, and plays out back of a gas station a lot with, you know, his friends. I'm like, but then you go to church on Sunday and, you know, there's no music. And, you know, and the, uh, the same thing I've told Bryce's story so many times growing up in South Georgia, I was, I was at my grandparents a whole lot. And theirs was a, um, you know, just Southern Baptist, fundamental Baptist church. Um, and I went every, every Sunday with them and every Wednesday and sometimes Saturday nights. And they would, they were the place, they had this big farm, this long driveway. And they were the, the place where all the church folks came out, their church family would yeah. come out, you know, and help them pick their corn and, you know, put up all the vegetables in the deep freezer. And, you know, then I'd be there. They, we'd, we'd have a big fish fry because they also had the fish ponds. And that was like a good way to grow up, those kind of things. But on the funny side of it, the comedy side is I could be normal, you know, wearing my little rompers and little bathing suits running around in the sprinkler. But if there was somebody from the church coming up that long driveway, I had to run back to my grandma's closet where she had this special outfit for me to put on that was so horrendous. It was like these long kulak things. It was like a skirt, but it was shorts. And you know, like, and I was just so upset because there were some cute boys at the church that would would come. And I mean, you know, I guess they still kind of thought I was cute, but it was just there was just no hope. It was just like that. I mean, it was like that all the time. And it was just my grandparents had all their friends over every week to play cards. They played pinochle and set back. But if the preacher was coming or anybody, you know, the real conservative church friends were coming, they had to hide the cards. I couldn't even play like, you know, old bait or anything or crazy eights or, you know, like my like kid card games. You had to hide the cards because that was evil. And why is that, Bryce? Is it because of tarot cards? Well, like, I know that tarot cards started, it was playing cards. Well, and we kind of talked about this. Oh, I don't know if we talked about this on air or off air, Davey, but are you familiar with the Hess Act from World War II? Uh, vaguely. I, I couldn't tell you. I've heard of it. I just don't know what it's about. It's the propaganda machine of the Nazis when, the, when Hitler made a deal with the Pope that they would start this propaganda campaign you know, at the end of the 19th century, the 1800s, we had this, like, we had Helena Vovonsky, we had the Fox sisters, we had spiritualism was really big, which, man, those people probably had a really good time. You know, they were doing their seances and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, people were kind of rediscovering this, like, spiritual side of life, right? There was this, like, huge, like, re reformation in an in individual's perspective of, of the afterlife. And in World War II... Uh, Hitler and the Nazis used a lot of divination. They used, you know, astrology, uh, tarot cards. And mm -hmm. but they decided that they uh, were going to do this like thing with the Pope where they were going to start this campaign, this propaganda machine that all these divination tools were of the devil so that the common man would be dumbed down to the actual spiritual sciences oh. so that they would have the upper hand knowing what's coming in the forecast in, in the, in the cosmology of the world. And that has still, so every time I hear someone say tarot cards are the devil, I'm like, you little Nazi, you are following some Nazi <laughs> propaganda. You need to research where this comes from because tarot cards themselves, all like, it's just a tool. That's all it is. And it's like, if you have a knife and my teacher in India talks about this a lot, if you have a knife, a knife can be used to cut fruit up, to serve somebody food or to hurt somebody. The knife isn't the problem. It's the hands using the knife that are the problem or not, you know? And so, so yeah, I think, I think that's what it's funny. My grand, my grandmothers loved uh, astrology. I had Davy, my, my dad's mom, she was cool. She was from Quitman, Georgia down real South. She used to hide books on reincarnation under the bed from my grandfather. <laughs> So maybe that's where I get my weirdness from. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, witchy just yeah. runs in your family. That's it just great. Runs in my family. It is. And it just runs. But yeah. So so is that is that from the? We, I'm assuming, David, you guys couldn't couldn't play like cards. Could you play like playing cards or anything? Or 
you know, my parents weren't really big on on that kind of stuff specifically. Uh, we weren't allowed to watch any, you know, modern movies or oh. TV shows, uh, rock music, even Christian rock music, which is the most watered down rock music of all time. Strictly forbidden. I remember my mom throwing away VHS copies of of all the movies that we had in the house, and and all we have left was these uh, films produced by uh, what was it called? Feature films for families which I believe was a branch of focus on the family that James Dobson ran. But what Angie was talking about with, you know, these fundamental Baptist churches, that's where, I mean, that's where Gothard got all of his teachings. The cult leader for the shiny, happy people cult was Bill Gothard. His ideas weren't new. This was nothing unique or, you know, earth shattering. It's not something, a new interpretation of the Bible or, or whatever. These were doctrines and principles that he primarily took from fundamental baptist ideology right so you know women wear dresses at all times um the men are in charge very patriarchal uh type view of things misogynistic if if you ask me but um that's really where he was getting his ideas from no dating right you weren't supposed to you weren't supposed to have premarital you know you weren't even supposed to to kiss before marriage uh in the cult that i grew up in um, so I'm still saving that first kiss. I've never been married. So. <laughs> I practiced a lot with my finger whenever I was little. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's what I was told to do. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> I didn't think you were talking about kissing for a second, Angie. And I, I got red. Now I'm hot. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I was nine years old. And this kid thing, Ron Moody, I tried to find him on Facebook so many times. I can't find him. I want to know if he, if he quit running away from home, he's always running away from home and stuff, getting in trouble. But I remember we were in the backyard and I, and he said, he leaned over to kiss me. And I said, I've never tried that before. I was terrified of it. And he goes, practice with your, with your thumb and maybe we can do it next week. <laughs> what a gentleman. Wow. <laughs> oh, that is his I, I ever got a kid, real kiss from him though. I don't remember. I think a consensual I was- king. We love it. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting because, like I said with you, Davey, on the first episode, I grew up very conservative Christian, but very liberal compared to both of you guys. I mean, my mother was the opposite. My mother was, I I have a memory. I was probably in my mid, actually my, like my mid twenties at this point, I was living in Los Angeles. And I was on the phone with my mom and I remember talking about some guy I was like, thought was cute or something. And she goes, well, is he married? And I said, no, he's got a girlfriend though. She goes, but he's not married. And I was like, mom, I'm just like, oh. accurate. I love I agree your with mom. That, yeah. mm-hmm. that was my mom. And that was even when, even when we were teenagers, she'd be like, go date all the boys. Go figure out what you like. Just go. She goes, I don't understand you kids. You have like a boyfriend. Like just go date every weekend. I always people. did. I always had a boyfriend. That was my mom. Yes. My mom was like encouraging us to like, just go out and just date all the boys, mm-hmm. you know? And I kind of have this rule. Like if I grew up with you, if I can remember what you brought to show and tell, or when you wore light up shoes to school, we're not dating. Like I just kind of have. You're not going to see me naked. If we, if, if I remember your your Ninja Turtle shoes, you're not going to see. That's just kind of that's just weird to me. Was I, I came from a very small school, but yeah. So I'm like I came from a totally. Even though I came from a conservative home, my mother was. My parents practiced birth control. Did your parents practice birth control, Angie or Davy? Did you guys do Quiverful or no? I don't know, but I got a really funny story in a little while. You just brought us. Actually, I wanted to kind of focus on a little bit too. Speaking of the dating life, this idea of purity culture, because mm. I feel like purity culture for the kids who grew up in the eighties and the nineties, I feel like we got it the worst, like worse than any other generation. If you look back at past generations, yes, there was there were stigmas on like premarital sex, but it wasn't as like I don't feel like it was as bad. As you know, if, if a woman got pregnant before she was married, they would just send her away to some aunt's house for nine months and then she would come back, you know, like there was I, I feel like there there was more pressure. And I even felt that even though my mother was really encouraging us to date, I felt that coming from my church, though, this idea of like not being um not acting. And I just I don't know. So I kind of wanted to talk about that a little. So. Davey, can you talk a little bit more about this courting concept? Because I think especially for our friends who are not from America or not from the Southern part of America, this is a very, it's wild to me anyway, as an American, but I feel like this is something people are really confused about because you just mentioned there was no dating. Can you, Mm -hmm. can you kind of explain that to our audience who don't know what this is? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, courtship is an extremely old concept. I mean, this goes back to, I think like the Victorian era, right? Uh, But courtship was this, um, idea of 
you don't date casually you foster relationships with the opposite sex for the intention of marriage right um but it goes even deeper than that because with courtship it was essentially just this modernized version of arranged marriage that that's really what it boils down to right as as a boy growing up in the cult i i had a lot more freedom as far as how i wanted my courtship to go so i could identify theoretically a female uh that i was attracted to and and wanted to pursue a relationship with the 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 women or the girls in the cult didn't really have that luxury right they kind of just had to stand by and wait for their dad to identify a a suitor right so i could go to my dad tell my dad hey i'm i'm interested in you know becky right she seems like she's you know got all the the qualities i'm looking for in a potential wife she covers her ankles with her dress i've never seen her collarbone doesn't listen to rock music you know she seems very meek and mild mannered uh never speaks in front of you know men uh which is all the things that that we were looking for of course um and so i would identify this this woman or this girl let my dad know i'm interested in courting her typically he would talk to her father to let him know of my interest and then as families they would decide do we let this relationship move forward and once you've entered into an well a, a courting relationship let's say um this is where it gets even weirder because you're never allowed to spend one-on-one -on -one time together um as a male and female in a courtship relationship that's supposedly progressing towards marriage right um, you're not supposed to spend alone time with each other. And it's essentially became this thing of families dating one another. So her family and your family would all go on a date to a restaurant or a movie and everyone, you know, just kind of participates in the growth and development of this relationship. Now that's a very uh, conservative view of courtship. I, I, I had friends that grew up in the cult that for them, courtship was just, they each had to have there, there needed to be at least, at least a chaperone for every date. Um, so it wasn't always necessarily both families merging like that. Um, but there were even more extreme instances where the girl really didn't have a say at all. Right. And it was just her dad telling her, you're going to court this guy. You're going to get married to this guy. And that's my final decision on it. And do it doesn't really matter whether you're attracted to him or not. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. This is who I have identified as a suitable husband for you. Um, you know, so it's just this archaic concept, and it's so, so, so damaging. Uh, and I've I've watched it unfold in, in a number of relationships where, well, you know, there it's just these kids, these naive kids that court and end up getting married they don't have an identity they don't know who they are and now they're trying to you know make their way through the real world um and realize i don't want to be in this relationship and it could even be a toxic relationship one of my one of my friends uh talked about how she was courting a guy when she was 14 years old and he was i want to say 17 maybe 18 mm -hmm. and one of the things that she explained was if her parents had given this guy permission to marry her at 14 years old, um, she would have been stuck in that relationship until she was 18 because she couldn't have gotten a divorce because she's not an adult. Um, so it's just incredibly toxic, just this gross misrepresentation of what true love and romance really should be. Uh, and what father, I know, Angie, you grew up under these kind of well, I'm, I'm going to tell the story because I, mean, I, I feel like I'm supposed to because when he said 14, I mean, oh, I, this is my, I, I think I alluded to you this story last night, uh, Davey, off camera, but go ahead, Angie, tell your story. <laughs> this, this is I won't tell all the details of the, can you say that word? But um, when I was 14, my dad was out of town and my mom allowed me to go and I was like you, I couldn't date or anything. Of course, I was only 14. I don't, I don't really think, well, you know. I let my daughter date, but I let her do all kinds of things because I didn't get to do anything. So, but, um, so when I was 14, my mom allowed me to go with friends to Athens. We at the time lived in Madison. So it's like a like 30 minute drive to a party at uh, some apartment. I barely remember the part. And, but I had to be home by a certain time. 
And I could see that the the little kids that rode with me weren't leaving. And I was going to get in trouble if I didn't get home in time. And the, this older guy, he was a senior. So I was a freshman in high school. He was a senior. So he, he was probably 18. He says, I can take you. And so he takes me <laughs> down a dirt road and stops the truck and the way I remember it, it was just an old, like probably Chevrolet or something. And when, when it was electric locks and when the, when the lock would go down, you could, I couldn't pull it up, mm-hmm. you know, you had to do it with the button. So I didn't know where the buttons were. Anyway, he raped me. So the next day I, he takes me home in time. I don't say a word to anybody except for my best friend. Um, I go to my school locker and there was a, a note in my locker from this guy. He says, I enjoyed making love to you, something like that, real short, and um, can't wait to do it again. All right, something like that. Well, I had planned on taking it because I knew I couldn't talk to my parents. You couldn't talk to my parents about anything, you know, so I knew I couldn't. So I was going to take that note to the school counselor (laughs) and maybe she could help me figure out what to do, get him kicked out of school, something. You know, at that age, I don't know what you're supposed to do. And I left it on my dresser by accident, went to school. My mom found the note, showed it to my dad. And I had, meanwhile, I had a little boyfriend who was actually in the eighth grade. He didn't even go to my school yet. He was in middle school. I was in high school. Like I had a younger boyfriend. I'm on the corded phone washing dishes after supper and talking to my little boyfriend. And I haven't told him what happened to me. And all of a sudden, my my dad says you have a visitor they had that guy that ran over to the house sat us around a table and said biblically you know each other and that means you have to get married oh and that guy was so excited he was like yes sir like and he was like so ugly like just you know, I mean, that's what I remember is like looking across the table at just like this monster. And, um, but yeah, so I, yeah, I, I he, my dad said after she gets out of um, ninth grade, we'll let her go through ninth grade. And, but yeah, y'all have to get married. And he would, he would take me to school and pick me up and he would go looking for trailers for us to live in. And so, uh-huh. um, and, uh, so yeah, um, as it, as the year, you know, starts getting, it gets closer and closer to where I'm going to be out of ninth grade. I'm thinking, is this really going to happen? Is this really going to happen? And I just kind of put on an act with my dad. He was coming home from one of his business trips. He would go on like a week long trip and come back. And as he was coming up the driveway, I was like, okay, okay, okay. I mean, it wasn't, I didn't have to fake cry. You know, I was really crying, but I really just ran up to his car window and said, daddy, 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 please don't make me get married. I want to be your little girl again. This is how you have to play them. Hmm. You know, I want to be your little girl again. I remember saying that to him and he didn't really say anything or even look me in the eye and he goes, all right. And that was just it. And then I didn't have to see that guy anymore and I didn't have to get married, but that's the, you know, I, I don't know, and it's just never ended, you know, so yeah, always controlled like what I could do, who I could see. Um, even like I was talking to Bryce earlier before you got on about my high school sweetheart at a wedding recently. And I mean, I was just telling him, I'm like, this is crazy. Like we probably would have ended up kind of staying together if it weren't for my parents. You know, they didn't, they didn't want us together. Um, so and he's really a nice guy. That's but, hard, isn't it, though? Like, when you think about, like, parents, I mean, I'm not a parent, and I know, Angie, you are. Like, you want to protect your kids, but what your parents did to you is not protecting you, no. you know? And and a 14-year-old, unless you're with another 14-year-old, you know, like, there, there's really, there's, I mean, my, my boyfriend is 11 years older than me, but I'm 40, he's 51. Like, that's different than when you're 14 and 18. There's a huge difference between a 14-year-old and an 18-year-old kid. You know, I think at 14, I might have still had a few Barbies laying around. Like, I might have still been, you know, that's that weird kind of like where you're in between a little girl and coming into a woman. And, um, and that's horrific, Angie. And that, I think, too, what happens as well is it's not just the trauma of what happened to you, but then the double trauma, the betrayal Mm -hmm. of the two people in this world that are supposed to protect you beyond all life and mom just sat there my mom sat there at the table and let it happen and now when i bring it up to her she says she doesn't remember it (laughs) 
<laughs> Which is entirely possible because your frontal cortex just shuts down in situations like that. So I'm sure it was very traumatizing for your mom as well. But I, I mean, the the phrase that resonated was, you know each other in the biblical sense. Yes. And, and that is what these types of ideologies set us up for. Um, when we take this so-called moral high ground, so in the name of moral purity, uh, for religious purposes, your parents thought, oh, well, she's got to marry this guy now. Obviously, he he took her purity um and that's the that's the answer that's the solution mm -hmm. to perpetuate the trauma to to feed you to the wolves uh but that that is that is so standardized uh in this type of fundamental christian environment a lot of times yeah well, and even the year later, you know, he came, it's always when he was coming home from a trip. I don't know what he would think about in the car on the way home from the airport. <laughs> it would get him all crazy. But he um, walked in one, one night and I was all excited to show him what I was working on in school. I was a real smart girl in school. Um, great grades, all A's, like, but still didn't go to college. I'm glad I didn't go to college at this point. But um, so, but he, uh, he walked in one night and I was going to show him my project that I was working on. And he looks at me and he says, you sure have grown into a, a beautiful girl, but I can't stand to look at you and just shoot me away. But, you know, I'm like my mom, you know, it was late at night. I was up trying to finish this project. Um, so like, so your, dad, your dad couldn't handle your womanhood. The fact that you were becoming a woman mm -hmm. and he recognized how pretty you were, but couldn't stand to look at. I mean, oh, that's whenever I was I'm pregnant with my third child. And we were getting ready to go to Disney. Like we were going on a family trip. And my mom and dad came by the house before we left. And I still remember like what I was wearing. It was like a maternity top, but it was spaghetti straps. Mm -hmm. Oh, he goes, you're going to wear that in public? Like, and my mom would have been like, that looks cute. Yeah, I'd wear this. And you know, like, what? you know what I mean? Like, I don't care. Like, huh? yeah. Well, well, let's so so with that story, Davey, as a man, if, if if a boy is caught in the IBLP making advances on a female that's not wanted by that female, how is that how is that treated? Is the man rewarded? Because we've seen this with like the Duggars, where it seems like they protect Josh mm -hmm. and they just leave their daughters to the slaughter. Mm -hmm. And same thing that with you, Angie, like this 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 predator that now is a felon, like a, he's a criminal now for, for CP. Um, but he's still like protect. This is wild to me. So where is this, is that even, so if, if that situation, Davey, if you, had, if a boy had like been, um, known a female in a biblical way, but it wasn't her choice as teenagers, was that common? And the woman was kind of been saddled up to this guy that was her abuser for the good of the, the purity to, to, to maintain her purity. Is that, that that I don't know uh, as far as the specific instance that happened to Angie and Angie, I'm so sorry. That's just absolutely horrific. Uh, certainly in, in the case of pregnancy, absolutely. Um, if uh, a, a man and a woman um, become with child, I guess, and, and they're not married, then that is the expectation that, okay, well, now you've created life together, so you must get married at this point. Um, and, and that's just kind of standard, right? Um, at, at least in in these very conservative, fundamental Christian environments, uh, and, and certainly in the cult, although there are some stories that I'm familiar with. There was a, a girl that uh, lived at the cult compound in Taiwan. She got pregnant, not sure by who, but when they found out that she was pregnant, she just got kind of sent home, swept under the rug. Let's just pretend that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I think the more problematic, um, the more problematic thought from the cult's perspective but behind a lot of this stuff is that um, it's the, it's, it's the woman's fault, right? It's the girl's fault because she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. This didn't have to happen. If, you weren't at that party where you shouldn't have been. You were out from under your umbrella of protection. And that's why this horrific thing happened to you. Um, you were wearing clothes that were creating eye traps um, and, and lust uh, for this predator. And if you hadn't been doing that, um, might not have happened to you. Uh, there was th there's this instance that happened at one of one of the 
primary compounds uh, for the Colts. Uh, and I, I mean, in in today's day and age, this would be so problematic because it was one of the like one of the top guys, one of the top leaders in the cult. Uh, and he ended up having a relationship with his secretary. In, in in anyone's opinion today, that would be considered an abuse of power, right? Um, but he also happened to have a wife and a ton of kids because quiverful, right? Um, when he was caught cheating on his wife with his secretary, he he left his wife to start a new family, um, and they were just kind of left to fend for themselves. Uh, but the cult released a publication basically instructing women how not to let their husbands cheat on them, not admonishing men. Hey, don't cheat on your wife, but instructing women. Here's what you need to do to make sure that your husband doesn't step outside of your marriage, yes. which is just mind blowing. My first, my first job, well, one of, I had lots of jobs, so maybe my third job, is I worked with a bunch of older ladies at a bank, and they would tell me that kind of stuff. They would say, now, you're newly wed, and how, you know, how often do y'all, you know, mm -hmm. I was like, well, they're like, you know, if you don't keep him happy, he's going to find somebody that will, like, so it's kind of the same thing, it's like, <laughs> You know, I'll just never forget that. But see, mad though is it's it's degrading to men as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that, a man can't just love a woman and understand. You know, have you heard of the transformed wife? Either of you? Uh -huh. um, no. She's this blogger. She's awful. She's this blogger who promotes this bullshit. Like she's like a a Debbie Pearl wannabe, and she posts things all the time. And she and and I'm just gonna say, say what you guys want to. I can go back and bleep words later when the editing process. So I don't want us to have to like. Um, you know, skirt around. This woman asked her, sent in, and she does like a question answer. And this woman sent her an email and said, "My husband, like, basically, the woman had said no, and her, and she woke up in the middle of the night with her husband on top of her, and she asked Debbie, or not Debbie, she asked this transformed wife lady, what is this rape?' And she answered, "No, because your husband can't." Mm -hmm. And it caused quite a stir because everyone's like, "Absolutely, your husband can." And I'm here. If anybody's watching this right now, listen, I went through most, I like bad boys. I've always dated the bad boys and I took me to my early thirties and to going through trauma therapy to realize you can date a bad boy. Who's not also an abuser. <laughs> like you can, mm -hmm. you know, and now that I'm in a healthy relationship, I can see that when a man loves you and you say no, for whatever reason, they're not going to want to then hurt you physically yeah. or emotionally. You're going to respect that and right. and still love you you know and and that's not and when a man loves you just like when a woman i, I know that's different for men and women but they're not going to want to like hurt you by cheating on you and and that is so i feel like because i know angie in the south i think women kind of are that way anyway like you always got to please your your husband yeah. um and i just i just it's that i feel like that's just so it's it it really kind of is degrading to the women to the sense where you feel like you can't say no. It doesn't mean you don't love someone because you got to have, you know, you think about women after they give birth, you know, I, I've watched my sister give birth three times. Your body is a wreck, right? Like those first couple of months after childbirth, your body, you just pushed a human being out of your vagina. Like your body is not, you don't feel you're, you're on a weird schedule. You're nursing. And at that point, I think it's okay to say no. And I think the father of that child, your husband would, or your partner would absolutely understand it. Well, let's, let's, let's make it clear. It's always okay to say no, regardless yeah. of whether you're recovering from childbirth or just had a bad day or yeah. you're not in the mental headspace for what if, it's always okay to say no. And there's this concept in the shiny, happy people cold. And, and I think it's, it probably goes far beyond the cult that I grew up and I'm, I'm sure it applies in a lot of fundamental Christian circles, but there was this concept specifically of receiving your husband joyfully, right? <laughs> Which is such a load oh, of shit. Um, because that that's that's not the way it's supposed to be. You shouldn't have to fake it <laughs> if you're not in the mood. Uh, but that's that is the kind of patriarchal misogyny that creates these mm -hmm. these environments that are ripe for manipulation and abuse uh, it's those concepts 
before we go, because I do want to go deeper into this. Can you quickly, though, because I know we didn't talk about this last time, and, and you mentioned the umbrella, and I realized we didn't. Can you mm. just quickly explain what that is to people that are like, what What do you mean by this umbrella system? Yeah, the <laughs> umbrella of authority. That was Bill Gothard's like, favorite thing to talk about in the basic seminar, right? So the umbrella of authority, an umbrella is meant to protect you from the rain, right? It 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 overarches you so that you are sheltered from the elements. In In Bill Gothard's opinion, your umbrella of authority is essentially God, the church, or your immediate authority. And in most families, that would be the father. And so as long as you are under God's umbrella of authority with your dad and your mom, um, you are protected from Satan. But as soon as you step out from under that umbrella, and stepping out from under that umbrella could be any number of things. Maybe uh, you decide to date instead of court. Maybe you're listening to non-sanctioned rock music. Uh, maybe you're going to the movies. Maybe you're experimenting. Um, it could be any number of things where you step out from the under this umbrella of protection. Now, all of a sudden, anything that happens to you from a negative standpoint at that point is deserved because you are not under the umbrella that you're supposed to be under um, you're exposed to Satan. Uh, and so it's all your fault. Anything negative that happens to you out from under that umbrella is your fault. And they will use that, I mean, ad nauseum, right? Uh, if if you're even a little bit prideful or you've created a, a stronghold of lust in your life, right? That These are the kinds of words that they use in the cult. That pushes you out from underneath this umbrella. And so anything realistically anything negative that happened in your life they would almost force you to trace it back to well this is where i stepped out from under my umbrella of protection aka outside of god's will and i deserve all of this that's happening to me and if you couldn't identify it then it was just god sending you through trials and tribulations to strengthen your faith these might when i'm hurt that made me think of hurricane katrina i remember people <laughs> saying well you know all that all that hedonism that goes there on in New Orleans. That's why mm -hmm. that's why God sent the hurricane. I I remember people say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I that I've heard people use like natural disasters as an ex you know, you know, yeah. weapon in my opinion, that's weaponizing God and God is not a weapon. Mm -hmm. Um and so for a woman, so you're so I'm a woman, I was born nineteen eighty three, a little girl grew up. If I was in this this cult, I would have been under my father's protection. And mm -hmm. as a woman though, there's not typically from what i understand a time where you go out and live on your own like you then get transferred to your husband so for women, you never have a point in this cult where you're able to kind of express yourself and be yourself and and like it, it just seems like women just have are taught from the very beginning that they don't have a voice at all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. No in their in their life and their protection and their own and protecting themselves and and i'm not i'm not because as a woman, I do, I love feeling that protection from a man. I, that's one of the things that attracts me to men is that they're bigger and they can protect and they can they, they can have that alphaness. But in a loving, healthy relationship, there is that protection with respect mm -hmm. and with respect of the the, the partner. And it's kind of a type of censorship, really, you know, just it's kind of the yeah. same thing. So when we, and I want to bring this up, too, because like when we look at the people like the, the Duggars. We know that from their show that a lot of these courtships end in marriage at a very young age, like 18, uh -huh. 19, when you're not, your brain's not fully developed. Lord have mercy if I had ended up with my boyfriend at 18. You know, he was real cute, but that was about it. <laughs> so, um, you know, you're just not ready at that age to make those those lifelong commitments. Um, but we look at people like Jana Duggar who is in her what her early 30s and still living at her father's. So at what point, is there a point in this cult where if a woman is not married at a certain time, she does have the authority to walk away or is she always just stuck in that little girl stuck under her father's control until the day he, what happens if he dies and the woman's not married? Does she go to her brother? That's a great point. I, I don't even know what happens in a scenario like that because because yeah, what, what you're saying, Bryce, is, is exactly accurate. Those those women really the only the only time justifiably um, in the most literal interpretation of what this cult believes that a woman should leave her father's house is if she gets married, right? Um, and, and so as long as you're not married, if if you grow up into an old maid, <laughs> right, you just you have to stay with your parents. Um, I don't know what would happen 
after you know your parents pass away what 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 do you do now i don't maybe go live at the church i don't know now you're under the authority of your pastor at that point it's but that's that's why this stuff is so ridiculous and ludicrous and and really what it ultimately does is dehumanizes women and they become objects they don't have their own identity and really their only useful purpose is to serve their authority figures whether that's a husband or a father or whatever right um and take care of babies have babies and take care of babies and the amount of pregnancies i'll tell you guys when my sister so my sister has two children who are like a year apart and then over the lockdown she got pregnant with my third niece so they're far apart in age so she has a covid baby and when my nephew called me to tell me that my sister was pregnant um he's on the phone with me he's like yeah bryce mom is pregnant and i hear my sister in the background go and i don't want to talk about it like she was so upset. <laughs> i think about that all the time with women in these situations like every and i know that every child is is i get like i get that like you can have a rough pregnancy and be shocked and still be grateful for your baby i totally get that but i think how many women you know is it is it possible that women are even practicing birth control without without even telling their husbands because they're just so i would do something like that i would be like I'm going to go get the pill and not tell him because I don't want to have any more. I don't want to do this again. Well, but at the same time, these women are brainwashed yeah, right? in the cold. These women are brainwashed and it has become their duty uh, to, to birth children. And, and so, you know, when you're indoctrinated like this and you're told repeatedly over and over and over again, this is what God wants for you. God wants you to have as many babies as possible. Well, at some point you get that sort of Stockholm syndrome uh where i mean may, maybe they are actually trying to have th this many kids and maybe they are you know in a fake way happy about it because that's the way now that their brain operates well, what kind of pressure is let me i want to talk about the men for a second because as you're talking i'm sitting here thinking like you and i are the same age davy and i and i and i can't help but think like how much pressure unnecessary pressure that is for a boy a teenager who's getting close to that marital age to know that he now is going to have to take a wife, support mm -hmm. her, and then support however many children they're blessed with. Like, it's all on your shoulders as the man. Like, how did that feel growing up? Did you feel that pressure when you oh, were? Oh, yeah. That, that, that is your responsibility as a man. You got to have a job, be able to provide because you're going to have a wife and a bunch of kids now. Um, you don't get really an opportunity to, to go find yourself. Um, you don't have the luxury of, you know, having your rebellious years, right? Right. Uh, because all of that would be, well, now you're out from under your umbrella of authority because this is what the Bible tells us to do. We are, so we need to find a help meet, right? I mean, it talks about it in Genesis. Uh, yeah. and so if you don't find that help meet, you must be doing something wrong. Uh, so if you're not getting a wife and then having kids, you're technically, unless you're doing a ministry of some sort right because I, I mean bryce you, you you would disagree with this but but jesus never got married <laughs> he, <laughs> he had he had his ministry right yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh yeah so unless you're unless you're ministering or you've you've decided that you just aren't going to have a wife because you need to dedicate your life to serving god that that was really the only reason that you wouldn't get married as early as possible and start having kids I mean, that, I feel empathy for the men because I'm sure in this situation, they're more good people than not. And to have that pressure at 16, 17 year olds old as a, my, my nephews will be 11 soon. I mean, he's not that far away, you know, at 11, that's only like what, five, six years before it, it, it were in this cold. I'm like, holy crap, I cannot imagine the amount of pressure that is for these young men to, to, you know, the wife, the woman is not trained to work. She's not supposed to work. She was work in the house. And I know that's a lot of work too. I get that. But, you know, as far as financially providing and, and you're right, like when, when couples are in, in the secular world, when they're young and they're getting together and they're both working and they're newly married, there's some fun in those poor years when you're getting furniture and, you know, it's a group effort where you, and you're, you're family planning, you know, my family, family planned, there's only two of us, you know, so um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that, that that is a lot of pressure to put on a young man to think that, you know, just by getting a wife now, he is now the head, the umbrella of of this mm -hmm. other child that he just married. Because let's be real, 18 years old for both. That's still, in my opinion, that's still kids, even though illegally <laughs> it's not, it's still kids, 
you know, and so now they're like they're playing grown up, they're playing mm -hmm. house. And um, so let's let's talk. Let's go there. Let's talk about sex. So in this cult, are and Angie, we can talk about the book too because I was gonna we we're gonna bring that up. I know I, I'm sure people are gonna be like, why is that book in her lap? <laughs> <laughs> it's red too. Look at that it's scandal. Time color. with Granny. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm the granny in this group. I'm 10 years older than both of y'all kids. So <laughs> so are women taught in this? I, I, I think I know the answer to this question. Are women taught that sex is also for women too? That there's pleasure for women as well? <laughs> I I honestly don't know, Bryce, because I never got the talk growing up. I Never, ever. We, we never discussed. I don't know if my... I know my little brother did uh, as part of the premarital counseling that he did with my parents before he got married <laughs> it's just crazy um I, I i love my parents i love my brother but they they still do some wacky stuff right uh not so much my brother just you know more so my parents but they're great and i love them i've got a great relationship with them uh but at any rate i i did not get the talk i i did not know what it was um i had some extremely uh misguided thoughts uh on you know what I thought it was uh, that were just completely off base. Um, and, and so I don't really know. It's almost like sex is avoided at all cost as a discussion topic other than don't do it. Just don't do it. Don't yeah. do it until you're married. And then when you do it after you're married, it's to have babies. Yeah. Right. So it's almost like this, this uh, fundamental Catholic approach, it's right? Kind of where, Yes, sex is for procreation. Yeah. Um, so I I honestly don't know a whole lot about it. I, I will never forget. So I got sent to a, a behavioral rehab at one of the cult compounds when I was 16 years old. Bryce, you and I talked about this, and it was for having a girlfriend, right? Um, and I actually uh, met another girl while I was at the compound um, in this intensive behavioral rehab program. Um so I got in trouble for having a girlfriend at home and then got in trouble again for uh, fraternizing uh, with a girl at the compound. But I will never forget, they, they, they sent me to this counseling session. And just to give you some context, I had broken my foot um, while I was at the compound. Um, and so I was in a cast and I remember my parents were in town because they were essentially coming to get me. Uh, because I was going to get, you know, kicked out of this program. Um, so my parents were there. We were in a hotel room, one of the hotel rooms at the compound. And this this guy comes in. It's an older guy. Um, I don't remember his name at all, but I'm laying in bed with my foot elevated. He lays in bed with me and then proceeds to tell me all about the evils of masturbation. <laughs> and I mean, explaining some of this stuff in graphic details and pantomiming a lot of it as well and asking me about my habits with masturbation. And I'm just mortified, number one, and extremely uncomfortable because I've got this old guy laying next to me in bed talking to me about something deeply personal. Um, and he was just acting like it was totally normal. Um, but also, I'd never had the sex talk. This is the right. first exposure I have talking to someone about sex at all. Um, and it was it was just such a weird moment, but it's seared into my brain. There's a lot that I don't remember uh, from the two or three months or however long it was that I was at the compound. There's a lot that I don't remember. I don't remember the conversation uh, in its entirety that I had with Bill Gothard when I when I got kicked out, uh, the interrogation I went through with him. Um that conversation I remember vividly yeah. Um, because of just how awkward and weird and frankly creepy it was. Isn't that weird how trauma will do that? You'll either remember <laughs> something like very, very specific. Like it was yesterday or you don't mm -hmm. remember it at all. Yeah. I had, um, I actually I can empathize with that. I have full memories of middle school and I only have sporadic memories of high school. And um, I, I met up with an old friend when I first moved back to Georgia from high school. And he was like, remember that trip we went on? And I was like, no, I didn't go. You, you're thinking of somebody else. And like the next weekend we went back up and he like had found pictures. And oh, there wow. I was. And I was like, I don't have any. There was a lot going on at that time in my life, too. So that's that's how trauma works is mm -hmm. you literally blank. You don't remember things. And um, 
it, I mean, that is, did you, your parents knew this guy was in there talking to you about this or? I guess. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if they knew what he was going to talk to me about. Um, but yeah, they, they knew he was having this conversation with me. Um, and she's got a son. He's how old your son? He's in his early twenties, right? One, 21. One. So like, could you imagine that Angie has a mother of a boy? Like <laughs> it was so weird. It was so, 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 and that, that was weird. But then we, we went to another counseling session. It was me and my parents. So all together in this counseling session, it was with this older black gentleman that was uh, a pastor at, at a church or a former pastor at a church. And he was uh, like close friends with Bill Gothard. And that one wasn't sinister, like the, the guy on the bed. Um, but what I remember about, about this guy is he would keep his, his hand in front of his nose and just. I mean, going to town, picking his nose during the middle of this <laughs> therapy session with my parents. Like, dude, do you think we don't know what's going on right now? Like, literally, he's just the whole time. And then, like, wiping it on a tissue. Just like, what the hell is happening right now? <laughs> he didn't eat it. I don't know. Like That's a, okay, fair point. Fair point, Angie. <laughs> but still, it was very, very weird. <laughs> I'll tell you, even though I was there thinking, Davey, man, you would have had so much fun with my mom growing up. She'd be like, yeah, you can take all the girls. <laughs> but uh, even I though love that. Yeah. Even my mother encouraged that, we still didn't really talk about sex. Like that really, mm -hmm. she would encourage us to date, but there were, you know, there's certain things you don't talk about. And I remember when my sister got pregnant with my nephew, she got pregnant with my nephew like a month before they were supposed to get married. So no big deal. But when I first found out she was pregnant, my first, it, I was excited because I was going to be an aunt. But then I was really excited because I was like, and I knew my parents knew I wasn't a virgin, but they didn't have proof. I was like, now mom and dad actually know she's not a virgin anymore. So, <laughs> so they found her out first for sure. Now, man, now, granted, I've lived with I'm, I've lived with a ton of men, so I had lived with men at this point, like obviously. But I was that like, didn't mean a thing. That didn't mean a thing, Brett. Y'all could be living proof. in separate bedrooms. They don't know. <laughs> they don't have proof. That That's right. They have no proof with my sister. Now they have three evidence <laughs> three little evidence <laughs> running around and she has actually done the deed so thank you to my sister for that that's <laughs> funny so i and, paid rent somewhere split rent with another girl who wasn't neither one of us lived at this place we both just rented like a little room in a house and pretended to our parents that that was our address we split the rent because we were both with with our our boyfriend. Yes. <laughs> How did you have so much disposable income at that point? I would have <laughs> loved that. I, I I used to model back when I was skinny. <laughs> still skinny, girl. You're beautiful. You should see Angie's ball game. I'm not surprised at all. Red pin, hair <laughs> products, Coca-Cola. Uh, wow. Coffee underwear. <laughs> girl. Girl. We'll gotta to get go some Google your name my after parents, this is over, parents, Angie. I'm gonna find parents, all the pictures. <laughs> my parents, oh, they, I mean, they just, I, I never told them, you know, but yeah, huh. I, yeah, I got discovered at the bank. You know, my mama, <laughs> when I, when she, when I was in eighth grade, we went bathing suit shopping and she made me get a bikini. And I remember, I mean, I was like four, I was skinny. I was 14, like 98 pounds. Right. And I remember putting that bikini on. My mom was like, well, if I had your figure, I would just walk around the town in a bikini. So my mother would have been very encouraging of your lingerie pictures. Angie, so. <laughs> I don't know. The jockey underwear was like ugly. You, like I was young. It was just like sports bras and like. Cotton. Hey, listen, that's all I had growing up. That is all I had for material, so yeah. to speak. My uh, son, my son, I used to get those Victoria's Secret catalogs come in the mail, you know, and I would find them in his room all the time under his bed when he was little, you know. Like oh. I wish th these were J.C. Penny catalogs. That's all yeah. I had yeah, access to because my mom would intercept the Victoria's Secret and throw me. them away. Oh, you probably did see me. <laughs> oh wow now Angie, oh boy, I'm gonna, some of those we, pictures. <laughs> I'm, i am googling your name when we are done it won't gonna... come up i've had a few names <laughs> oh, a bummer. um that my mama would have been very encouraging of that she was like if you got the figure just flaunt it just flaunt it just go out there and flaunt it so the one thing my mama was strict about is you don't leave that house without lipstick and mascara. <laughs> so that was yeah. the one thing she was strict about. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's, she wanted you to be as much of a Jezebel as possible. That's crazy. I mean, like she literally, I, I like I told you guys when I was in my twenties, she was, and I had a crush on a guy, and I was like, he's got a girlfriend. She was like, he's not married. 
not married. Like as long as he's not, I'm like, mom, <laughs> like, well, you're not wrecking an actual home. It's a fake home. Go wreck it. Fake home. <laughs> you know, I live with all these men and like, uh, but that's so like, funny. It's um, yeah. And that's, and, but my mom's very Southern. She's very, she's very Presbyterian, but I will say shout out to my mom. You know, I was thinking about this because I know Davey, we do want to do an episode on like the Joshua generation and the politics and all. And I will say, you know, shout out to my mom. She was a big old Republican. But I remember one time we were sitting at, speaking of teen pregnancy, we're at lunch with a bunch of ladies and their daughters, and they were talking about pro-life stuff. And I remember my mother didn't say anything. We just sat there the whole lunch, and she just ate and ate, did not say a word. And I didn't know what the hell this pro-life stuff was. I didn't know what it was. So we got in the car, and I asked my mom. I was like, why? Because my mom's a talker. And and I was like, Mom, why didn't you say anything? And she goes, because I'm not pro-life. I'm pro-choice. And she started to Mm. explain to me what that meant. And I didn't know that that was like big for the republicans to be pro-life because my parents are big republicans but she was pro-choice and my mother said well that's because as a republican i believe everyone has the right to the freedom of their own religion and she was like now if you girls get pregnant we believe life starts at conception and we will take care of that baby and we will love that baby but you don't have the right to tell another woman what to do it's her body and it's her faith and it's her and and my mother was very big about the church and state should absolutely be separate that the Mm -hmm. church should have nothing to do so that was very progressive of my mother i i have to give her props for that for being as southern and as somewhat conservative as she was and as presbyterian as she was she had some very logical grounded progressive views on things Yeah, i was about to say very very progressive which is so interesting views and even now at age 50 just a couple of months ago, I thought I was pregnant. <laughs> I was I was telling it because I'm a talker like your mom. You always say that I remind you of of her. But uh, I was at a store in Clayton, Georgia, and I was just telling the store owner all about it. I said, I think I'm pregnant. I, I can't fit into anything anymore. And I, I think I'm pregnant. And she goes, girl, what are you going to do? And I said, I guess I'm just going to start designing a nursery. <laughs> just because... <laughs> Well, and I will say in fairness to my mom with that too, like I, at that age, I didn't understand like finances, you know, I was young. And what she was basically saying was too, is that you're lucky. You come from a family that if you got pregnant could support the baby and give you mm-hmm. and the baby a good life. And we wouldn't force you to get married. We would be able, but there are so many people out there that don't have that. And I didn't realize right. that at that point, but she was talking about that. Like not only would this baby be loved and wanted, but it would be supported. And I didn't, I didn't mm-hmm. put two and two together until later on in life. When I started thinking about how cool my mom was to like, you know, not be, not kind of be more grounded and more logical about the situation of the world around us in that, you know, and that this was, you know, in our house, yes, life starts at conception, but that doesn't mean that's the belief in the house next door. And you don't you have. Know, you know, what's so interesting, Bryce, is you're talking about this. It's it's giving me some like aha moments, it, you know, the way that I was raised right with this courtship mentality. And, and that's how we dated. I, I'm, I'm realizing with this conversation how much it's impacted my dating life as as an adult years separated from the cult right because the the idea was with courtship you are dating to get married right that is that is the outcome of this courtship relationship is marriage that is where it's headed un- unless something drastic happens right um and even to this day as i'm dating i sometimes have a really not so much anymore but a few years ago i had a really hard time breaking up with someone even if I knew it wasn't working, it wasn't the right thing, it was toxic, it was whatever, right? I would have a very difficult time breaking up. And I think it's because of that ingrained mentality of, well, no, I'm dating this person to get married. That's that's the whole goal of dating. It's not just to get to know someone or have fun or maybe a short-term relationship or this is what I need at this stage in my life, right? No, this is so that I can get married. And I think it's all that old indoctrination and and brainwashing if you will from you know the 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 courtship mentality and so what you're talking about with pro life and pro choice you know growing up that way with those ideas and 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 opinions and, and how that influences you now i just it's so interesting how we carry that with us and, and for me i didn't even realize that i was carrying that with me still uh which is kind of crazy No, that makes sense. I mean, this is what I off camera. This is what I do with people. I help them work through their shadow side with the Eastern philosophy and stuff. And that makes a lot of sense because when we're children, that's where the most brainwashing happens. 
Mm -hmm. um, that this programming happens. And so those patterns, those thought patterns, it's in Sanskrit, it's the Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha, it's the thought patterns that engrave within us and create a pattern of life. And so, and it seems like now that when you start to recognize that, that's when the course correction can happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think most women, especially, I mean, the good thing about our age, Davey, is that most women, if you're dating around our age, have had a lot of life experience too. So they're not really, you know, I can understand like the young twenties, they have this idea that they're going to meet this man and it's going to be a Prince Charming and it can be a little, little dumb, you know, you're, you're, your early twenties are your dipshit years for both boys mm -hmm. and girls, kind of your dipshit years. Right. Um, but, but when you get older, you kind of do kind of get a little bit more relaxed. Like I was laughing with some of my clients, my students the other week about, um, nursing homes that it's like the highest level of STDs yes. because those, those people are like, we're not getting married. Like we don't have that much. Let's just have fun. Like they're fine. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, my Unless you're Angie and you can still get pregnant at 50. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Granny King still get pregnant. <laughs> Girl, that's I didn't know that. That's hysterical. That is funny. Oh, yeah, I didn't tell you, did I? No. Well, but but sorry. going back to like, and I hope it's okay. We're just going on all kinds of tangents. But um, going back to like the talk, like did your parents give you the talk? And I was sitting there going, I need to tell them that I actually learned from my parents um, by accident. Did so, you walk in? <laughs> no, it's worse. But it's kind of funny. <laughs> this is uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Did they, did they have a surrogate where they swing? It's like, what? In Albany, Georgia, there was something happened. I don't know why, but we had like a snow day. It was being like an ice, you know, ice storm kind of thing down there. So all everybody's parents were at work. And all the kids in the neighborhood, like a bunch of them came over to my house and they were like, you got any cool movies? And I said, no, I that's all, all I had was like the um, Andy Griffith show and the Beverly Hillbillies. My parents would record all those episodes. I know every single one of them by heart. Um, that's all I could really watch that and Woody Woodpecker, stuff like that. Um, and so I was like, I think <laughs> I think I know where some are. Ooh. I'll be right back. And so it's like the Ooh. VHS. <laughs> and we're like, I can't remember, we're like seven or eight. I mean, we're like little kids. And I go um, to my parents' room and up on top of the dresser, there was a shoebox with um, VHS tapes in it. A hidden shoebox? Was it a porno? <laughs> and I just, I just assumed they were like, you know, really good movies that I wasn't supposed to watch, which is like, I mean, I guess. It's a porno. It's a really Turns good out. <laughs> It was called Debbie Does Dallas. I remember that. I was like, but I, uh, anyway, but anyway, but I did, I didn't choose that one. I just I chose another one. I just stuck it in the, <laughs> the player. <laughs> and they're waiting for it to come on. And I'm like, what is that? Y'all. So you put it in the fun house and you didn't even know it. It was my mom on screen like laying in the bed and then all of a sudden you see like my dad come bouncing across the bed they're completely naked and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> they were pioneers though uh -huh. i mean i remember those big <laughs> video tape recorders yeah i mean that <laughs> took some effort I've got one out there somewhere. I don't know where it is. Okay. Well, your kids <laughs> their grandparents made a home movie. I'm doing such a deep dive on Google later. I swear <laughs> I will. <laughs> now, I heard recently from my high school boyfriend that his first wife made him throw it away in the dumpster. <laughs> so somebody's got a copy of that. I've never made one of those movies. <laughs> I've never done that. Nice. It's fun. It can't, what, anyway. what is it with y'all that grow up with all these freedoms and privileges <laughs> yeah. and you don't even use them? It's like a waste. It's I a see, waste. Yeah, I, I didn't grow up with that. I had to sneak to do everything. And so I was doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, I've taken pictures before, but I've never, you know, I mean, you know, and you know, Todd, I, I don't think he would ever <laughs> be like, put that shit away. I don't <laughs> trust you. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I, used to, I used to be called, like, for a little while, the Black Magic Woman. That song, I would use that oh, song. It was a good, like, it had a good rhythm. But anyway. Good Lord. <laughs> this 
is this is us southern girls it's always the, it's always the prim and proper ones <laughs> that's it it's always the it's always the sweet uh, demure church girls just like what have i done <laughs> i think i've just <laughs> lost my soul <laughs> I don't, i'll tell you the funniest thing angie said and then i know we're over an hour now but um we were uh david we were talking once about the southern prayer circles how these women get together and have prayer circles and it's actually a god they gossip they go to dear mm -hmm. lord please protect this family because we hear that susan's cheating on her hut like they're telling gossip as they're praying uh -huh. um, that's how they justify it and angie goes she goes yeah they're a coven <laughs> everybody in this town knows that i'm going through divorce right now everyone i'm going to an event pretty soon where i know all of them are going to be at too and it's a comedy show actually and I'm, it's going to be taped <laughs> while i'm there so it's karen morgan but anyway i can't wait to see all these witches these covens and i'm called a witch they call they say i'm practicing witchcraft just because i burn sage and you know, I'm practicing. Don't go to church anymore. And I don't know. I left the church. So um, I'm, a, I'm practicing witchcraft. Oh, honey. Well, witch means wise. Yeah. Woman, so I'll take it. Anytime someone calls me a witch, I'm like, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, you guys. Well, I know we're going to have Davey back on because I do want to do the Joshua Generation episode with him. I really want to take a very serious look. And Angie, show that book quickly. We, um, Angie and I had talked about just for the audience, leave it in the comment section below. It's called Four pleasure intended for pleasure. intended for pleasure i have it in my amazon shopping cart now davy something we do on this channel sometimes is we read through books and give commentary usually i pick very um i don't can i read books, books very this spiritual very books. graphic but um <laughs> we can put it on the rumble channel but and she texted me one night when she was cleaning out her bookcase and was like we should read this book together on the youtubes and give our commentary so you guys if you want to do sex ed with Angie and Bryce <laughs> with intended for pleasure and us give our commentary on how it's all about making him happy and not the woman. Um, let us know in the comment section below. Again, if it is very graphic, we might have to put those episodes on rumble where there's no censorship. Just let us know down in the comment section below and you too can get your own copy. I have a, I have a comment. I've <laughs> will any of it be simulated? <laughs> Cause I'll watch. <laughs> <laughs> Some realistic looking things. <laughs> Doll, and did you use dolls? I don't know. I've never, never had it. Never had to. I've never been at a lack. I'm just gonna say it. Thank you, God. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Thank you, my mama Alice. I've never been at a lack for a man. I've always had a man somewhere. So uh, <laughs> so I've never needed that. But um, so you guys let us know down in the comment section below. Also, let us know if you want us to continue these, if these if these conversations are therapeutic. Because I do know that a lot of my viewers grew up in a very conservative Christian. Actually, a shout out to one of my moderators. I won't say her name because I don't want to embarrass you. She was a, a minister's or a preacher, I don't know which one's a daughter in a Baptist church. And she is like the most badass women that I have. She moderates my, my groups and she is a freaking badass because she has taken control of her life and has definitely worked, really worked on herself to free herself oh. from that bondage. And that has been always been my point going through the missing Bibles, going books of the Bible, going through all this channel material is to give people liberation, to help them like realize that God is not mad at you because you had sex. God created sex. Like the, God made that. Like that's not you know, it, it's it's a powerful it's a powerful exercise when you're doing it with consent. It's a very wonderful thing, and so I, yeah. If you guys want us to continue going deeper into these conversations, we are going to be bringing uh, Davy back. And yes, Davy, I think you are definitely a crowd favorite for the women. You've got a huge fan club of women that all emailed me wanting to know again if you were single. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so I think me and Angie are together now. Actually, sorry to. Okay. First, everyone's. Oh, this is what I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I got on my red lips and everything for you. Okay. Yeah. It's got a cleavage out, everything. Oh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have never. Oh, you know, and I couldn't wear a bikini. I couldn't wear, you know, uh uh. Mm -mm. Well, y'all just had the wrong. You, if you had my mama growing up, you would. I had, to, I, was, I had to quit the swim team because I wasn't uh, allowed to wear a Speedo uh, anymore. Yeah. That, that is at, like the absolute truth. And I was really good too. Is, I could have been, I could have been Michael Phelps. <laughs> and instead I tell wow. dick jokes. <laughs> wow. 
we all have our own paths. It's fine. It's real. Right. So I believe um, that there's so many things that, you know, hindered like my, you know, things I could have done, gone on and done, you know, but anyway, yeah, I know we've got to stop this, but, um, well, I, but David, you're going to be in Georgia, right? You were telling us off camera. I know you don't have all the yeah. dates, but I will definitely advertise. If you don't have the dates on you, uh, you'll be in Macon and in Savannah for some mm -hmm. shows. And so, um, if you live, I have a lot of Georgia viewers are in the surrounding states and you want to go to a good comedy show. I will post those dates. Just send me the dates, David, and I'll put them up on the community tab. Yeah, I will get those. I should have them. I don't know why I don't have them. This is part of my problem is I'm not terribly organized when it comes to that kind of stuff. I just like showing up and telling jokes. But yeah, I'll be at the uh, Macon Art Center. I want to say it's it's in October at some point. And then I'll be in Savannah. I believe that's in January when I'll be in Savannah. Um, but yeah, I, I love coming to, to Georgia. Um, Atlanta. I love Atlanta. I love the diversity in Atlanta. It's always just such a cool vibe there. Um, um, and the strip clubs are great there. Uh, and that's <laughs> kind of my safe I was space, about to say, so. you were, in the beginning, you said you, you dated uh, strippers. Have you ever been to Claremont Lounge? Here I have not. No. How about the Claremont Lounge? Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to check it out. It's fantastic. If you're in Atlanta next time, I will take you, Davey. I will take you to the Claremont Lounge. I will pay for you to get in and experience. You've been to the Claremont, right, Angie? No, but I know about it. <laughs> yeah, there's strippers there. It worries me that it's called a lounge. Anytime something's called a lounge, it's always like, Ugh, what are we about to get into? <laughs> they do. What Blondie? She's there's some Atlanta celebrities that work at the Claremont. Land. It is strippers on steroid. Like they they can do it. tricks with their boobs. They're older ladies. They're of the older kind. Huh. It's maybe sort of like the comedy club of strip clubs. It's right? a okay. popular hangout here in Atlanta, Georgia. I used to go all the time. Um, I love that. Yeah, you go and they have karaoke night, and the ladies just dance while you're singing. You know, I size baby, and they're up there, and they crush them with the coke cans with their boobs, and <laughs> shooting ping pong balls out and stuff. I love that. <laughs> yes, so it is. It is a Atlanta landmark. So if you're if you're ever in Atlanta, make sure you go to Claremont Lounge on Ponce Ponce de Leon Avenue. They, the hotel used to be abandoned, but they just redid it, and now it's got rooms. So, um, <laughs> so if you find a good strip you like, <laughs> I'll meet wow. you there, Davey. I'll see you there. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have such a good time <laughs> oh, okay. so and and what will we get andy we'll plan we'll go to one of his shows we'll plan it we'll we'll do a girl's trip down to i'm close to making um uh, let's do the making one for sure yeah mm -hmm. and um and um, i'll get you david we'll set you up with the uh my friend who was the artist of the almond brothers out with eda peach and the um widespread pan uh, i'll have to tell you a really funny story though before we sign up about the widespread panic paintings because we get a lot of his paintings and they're they're we give them as gifts and my stepfather is like an incredible he like is like a savant when it comes to rock music like he can hear it and he tell you who the who the person is who wrote the song when it was written he has this little man cave in a bar at my parents house and so we got these paintings for him and you know the paintings are very they're subliminally like penises like that's what they are the mushrooms that he paints my mama I, even though she was very progressive i don't think she realized that's what they were she went and got those suckers professionally framed <laughs> <laughs> it's like the opposite of georgia o'keefe that's so cool so they have, I love like, it. all these great penises on the wall of their... does she know now maybe now that when she watches this she'll know because i know she'll watch it so yeah and she's got it hanging up over her bed <laughs> just making your dad feel impotent all the kids toys like my my the grandkids toys are like in toy boxes below all these pictures. oh they're gonna have so much it's, weird it's, freudian it's, stuff when they get older <laughs> <laughs> but bless her heart all right you guys well i've had so much fun thank you guys this was a very serious conversation but it was also a very comical conversation and i agree with you davy comedy it can be very very healing to be able to get to a point that's what i appreciate about all the scientology people is they all seem to have a great sense of humor about all of their trauma as well and so and as rom Doss says we're all just walking each other home we're all just trying to figuring out this figure out this human thing together and sometimes we go way wrong like the iblp and sometimes we go a little right um and so um so i thank you guys for being here let us know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below and if you are from another country and you have some iblp questions because i know i have a lot of people from other countries that watch my show so leave those questions also in the comment section below so we can also help address um the i know the iblp did have some some groups outside the united states but um i want to make sure that i know europe has a more liberal approach to things than we do anyway so anyway guys well thank you two so much for making my afternoon fun <laughs> so thank you all right we'll talk to you guys soon bye everybody